my presentation is 10 signs that FISMA will be automated. So first I want to do a little baseline. If people know what FISMA is, if they have felt the pain. So how many people, do I need to even define what it is? How many people know what FISMA is right now? Okay, so about, about a, a third. Uh, FISMA is Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002. It is basically IT compliance. Within the federal government, whenever you roll out a technology system, it has to be, you have to show that it is protecting information appropriately, especially personal, personal identifiable information. There's something called an authority to operate. You're not supposed to roll out a public facing IT system that does not have an authority to operate. And to get an authority to operate, you have to show that it is compliant. It has to go through certification and accreditation. Uh, maybe some of you have run into 508 compliance for accessibility. Um, FISMA compliance is the larger security stuff. So have, now that I've explained it, how many more hands? Now, does it sound at all familiar, security? <laughs> yes? OK. Um, how many people have directly felt the pain of not being able to deploy a system because security says it won't work or that there are issues with the review? Anybody? No? OK. Well, we've had to fix things. You've had to fix things. Has it been a pleasant experience? <laughs> no? OK. All right, so um, I, as I said earlier, my name is Greg Allen. I actually worked as the chief data officer at the FCC uh, for a number of years. I was one of the first uh, chief data officers in the federal government. So even though I don't do earth science, uh, I do a lot with data and with open data. So I've been there, and I've done that. Uh, and I'm now a partner with Civic Actions which is a Drupal agency, has worked a lot with um, local and state government, and has worked um, with federal government, and now is, a, is uh, their prime contractor on something called GlobalNet, uh, which is an international uh, education tool for defense security cooperation. Uh, so they are actually taking that through IT compliance, uh, which is how we got connected. So why is IT compliance painful? Um, <coughs> And before I show the next slide explaining this, if there's still something in the back of your head saying, you know, I don't really have to worry about this. I'm a, I'm a data science person. I'm a science. I don't, I, you know, I'm working on the website. We have a security group. We have to worry about it. So whenever I talk about security or IT compliance, what I want you to do is substitute in your head data quality assurance. Okay? So... Because that is a very big, how do I know that my data is going to be of high quality? How do I know if it goes out there in the world that someone's not going to change it? If I'm getting data from another science project or off of the web, how do I know where that data came from? Those are the exact same set of questions that security people are asking about their systems. And increasingly, because of, increasingly because of virtualization, the perimeters around our information systems and our data have disappeared. Our data is just floating out there up on Amazon or moving across different websites. We don't have these security perimeters anymore. So now the question is, is how do I protect the quality? How do I do information assurance of something that is wandering around across the internet? Right. So even though you may not feel this right now, this is going to be haunting you. Because you're, and a, a question? Yes. Well, yeah. Right. Right. So, so even though I'm I'm going to be coming at this from the angle of, of system security and compliance, think about it in terms of data quality assurance and this and that and what and how do we make that release process automated, as opposed to a very manual dragged out back and forth um, uh, in email. So why is why are these processes, why is compliance so painful? So <laughs> I think one of the major reasons is that the NIST risk management framework is outdated. It's from an earlier era. FISMA, the law, says government agencies have to make systems secure. 
and everyone has to follow a standard approach to doing the compliance. That standard approach is known as the NIST Risk Management Framework, developed by NIST. And it was developed between 2002 and 2004. Unfortunately, that framework is document-based. It's a bunch of guidance and documents. It's also very waterfall. It makes complete sense. First, you identify what is, what I classify my system. Does it have any personal identifiable information in it? Is it security, you know, is it classified? So I classify my system, then I pick the controls that I'm going to use, then I put those controls in place, make sure the controls work, and then I can deploy. But if you think about that, that's very waterfall. And we increasingly live in an agile world. So that waterfall process doesn't work in our, added, in our waterfall way. Waterfall tends to assume kind of unlimited resources and time. Like first, this team will come up with the requirements. Then this team is going to develop it. And then this team is going to do the quality check on it. And then this team is going to deploy it. Right? So that's, so same thing with, um, with when you're doing IT compliance. And the problem is we live in a world where I got to get this stuff out tomorrow. Or I got to get it out by next week. And we don't necessarily have time to move things through those processes. So that's one of the reasons it doesn't work. I mentioned perimeters earlier. Now, there is something within the NIST risk management framework called SCAP. Does that word mean anything to anybody in this room? OK, so it's, I hadn't heard about it and, until I got lucky to connect to community. SCAP stands for Security Content Automation Protocol. It was designed to try to automate this stuff. However, it turns out that SCAP is actually eight different XML standards combined. And so you're programming in XML if you've ever tried to do that. So these are the problems. So 10 signs that this is all actually changing. So number one, virtualization, right? Um, we live in a virtual world where our infrastructure is virtual and we can literally describe our infrastructure inside of a code repository. Uh, one of the tools that I've learned over the past years is called Vagrant. People heard of Vagrant? Right, Vagrant is awesome. It allows you to boot up on your own computer one or more virtual machines. Um, you can use Puppet or Chef. Puppet and Chef are tools for their kind of orchestration or deployment tools. But basically, you can write a piece. If you, have you, how many here have heard of Drush for Drupal? Right? So you can think of Vagrant and some of these other tools as drush for entire infrastructure. Pick an OS, launch the OS. Um, I set one up, really cool. I set up a Vagrant where I launched, um, I launched a LAMP stack on one server, and then I launched a second server that had MySQL on it, and then it installed not only the database, but it installed the actual data that I needed for the project. What's really powerful about this is instead of constantly changing my own computing environment for three different projects, the one from four years ago that was using Drupal 6 and an earlier version of PHP, and the one that I'm doing now, which might be Drupal 7 and is using a newer version of PHP, I don't have to change my computing environment around. I just launch these virtual environments. So I do one project in one in, in, with one set of virtual computers and another. But what's happening here, because this is all virtualized, is I'm not putting computers in racks. I'm not installing the operating systems. And what I'm getting is the ability to create exact reproducibility of how that system is configured, from the operating system all the way up to the application layer. So this is a really, and now, have you, who's heard of Docker? OK, a couple of people. Heard, Docker has just taken what's been going on with virtualization and has been a false force multiplier. So basically, you can use Docker to launch one or more systems on bare metal in seconds. It's pretty amazing. If you've ever gone through a two-hour process of installing or an all-day of trying to remember, how do I set up, the, how do I set up Solar? Because if you install Solar, if you want to do a candidate, not only do you have to install Solar, you have to install Java, you have to install Tomcat, and you've got to get them all configured correctly. I could never remember how to do it now that I have it inside the virtualization. So I'm taking a little bit of time here because I'm setting the stage. Are we moving at an okay pace? This is great. Right? It's good? Okay. 
So um, Docker, Docker is literally, um, you have to kind of see it to believe it, but it basically is packaging up entire aspects of applications and, and infrastructure, and you can deploy with a single click. Uh, okay, number two, so this is driving, and I guess the big thing here, um, going from months to get a system up and running to minutes, literally, from months to minutes, right? So number two, DevOps. I'm guessing this is also a new term. It's basically a cultural movement. It's development and operations working together in love with each other, skipping down the street. <laughs> hard, hard to imagine as it is. Uh, you can watch, there's some great videos. If you just look up, if you just look up um, DevOps and videos on YouTube, wonderful presentations out there. Um, Gene Kim, why we need DevOps. Um, and uh, I'm forgetting Adam's last name, uh, some great ones. Uh, the big thing about DevOps is, is really kind of getting over the silo nature between dev and ops. Um, we, if you work in federal government, there's something called separation of duties, which what it meant for me was we were never allowed to look at a production server. So if something was going wrong, we would try to figure out what was going wrong by telling the system admins what commands to run and then sending us email with that information. Uh, the, now the big news is DevOps Days is coming to DC. It's going to be a two-day event all about DevOps. That'll be, and it'll be the first time that it's in DC. So this is very exciting um, because it's an opportunity for the agencies that are getting involved in DevOps to come together as well as the, um, the startup community that's in DC. So DevOps is, DevOps is huge. Uh, and, and basically, as I said, you know, about what I was saying before about virtualization, the big thing about DevOps, if you've done Agiles, DevOps is Agile for infrastructure and operations is another way of thinking about it. OK, number three, um, DevOps audit, the DevOps defense audit toolkit. Uh, this is a Google community uh, with over 300 contributors. And essentially, everything I'm talking about with virtualization and DevOps and this other stuff, how do you show it to an auditor who's expecting a 300-page system security plan? When the FCC deployed its new website on Drupal, we had a 300-page system security plan that we had to put together that was written in Word which I, you know, I'm not exactly sure how many people read these. Uh, there's value in going through the exercise. But anyway, um, so this is a wonderful little link because it, this is a group of people saying, hey, we love DevOps. We have to help the audit community who's used to getting these big checklists and documents understand that if I can give them my Vagrant script or my Puppet script, that that's much better documentation than something in a Word document. Okay, uh, my, okay, number four is Red Hat 7. In the new version of Red Hat 7 that's coming out, you will be able to pick during install from a dropdown what government profile you want the server configured as. It will be part of the install process that you can select a FSMA compliant profile. I'm mixing some words here. I'm not using exactly the right terms of art. But, um, and you'll be able to do that in Red Hat. So I think the question here is why not in Drupal as well? Drupal is known for its modules. It's known for the configuration. And I really think what we're talking about is the opportunity to have modules that speak directly to IT compliance or data quality assurance and have those as part of the install. So that when I download Drupal, I ought to be able to pick a configuration that I know has already gone through the authority to operate pr procedures. I know that it's already gone through that at a government agency. So that we're sharing that. If Ken is able to get his version of Solar through and up and, and deployed, then we ought to be all we ought to be able to get his information and share that. Right? So I think that that's, that's, the big, that's the big takeaway here. This is the opportunity for Drupal. Uh, my numbers, I think, are a little bit out of order. 
Um, so I think my numbers are a little bit out of order. So here's another sign. Uh, die cap and the NIST grant risk management framework. Uh, when the risk management framework was set up, it applied to federal civilian agencies. And there was a separate framework called DIACAP, which was set up for the Defense Department. Very similar, but not exactly the same. Anyway, as of 2014, DIACAP and the NIST Risk Management Framework are now merged, and the Defense Department is supposed to be following the Risk Management Framework. And what that means is there is approximately $14 billion spent on security and IT <coughs> compliance within the Department of Defense, and now that energy is going to be merged with um, what's happening over at the civilian agencies. So that's a very positive sign um, of doing this. The next sign is the information security continuous monitoring memos. This is very applicable if you are at a federal agency. There are two memos, M15 and M1403. M15 is about what you have to do for reporting for FISMA for the fiscal 2015 year, for the fiscal year 2015. It's guidance on that, okay? In that memo, it says that it mentions memo M1403, which basically says that every single agency has to have an information security and continuous monitoring strategy in place by February 28th, and they all had to be filed through CyberScope with OMB by November 2014. So that means that somewhere in your agency, within your security group, there should be an actual plan for continuous monitoring rather than waterfall. And it also means that in 2015 and 2016, people are going to be implementing this. So it's a great time to figure out how Drupal is going to map towards a continuous monitoring strategy. Questions so far? Thoughts, observations? Still doing pretty good? Great, OK. All right. In relationship to this plan, people have now figured out the plans. Um, I'm actually working on a project that is sponsored by DHS host to map the 853 controls to continuous monitoring. Now, there's this famous document, if you've done any type of IT compliance, that always call, comes up called NIST Special Publication 853. And people refer to it as the 853s. The 853 has a big appendix which lists out over 300 specific security controls in great detail. These controls are things like you should be using a complex password, right? There should be guards around the data center. The data center should be behind a locked door. <laughs> The 853 controls is a very detailed catalog of controls that run from physical to logical. Mostly, if you're a software developer, you care about the logical controls, the complexity of passwords. Do I have an audit trail if someone changes something? Right? You don't really care about the physical controls, et cetera. You tend to inherit those from the data center. But basically, so um, host is uh, Homeland Open Security Technologies. It's using open source software in support of uh, secu cyber security. And anyway, uh, have a little bit of support. So what we're going to try to do is now that people have these plans, we're going to try to really take it. The problem with is the 853s are a narrative description in a document. And so you, everyone has to figure out how do these apply to Drupal? How do these apply to Linux? How do these apply to Microsoft Word? So what we're going to try to do is, is do a better mapping of some of that for the continuous monitoring. OK, uh, another sign. Uh, the Security Automation Workshop of 2014 was very introspective in saying, it's been about 10 years since we've had the NIST Risk Management Framework. What's working? What's not working? Um, how do we do these things? What do we really need to fix for security um, to get more automated into work? One of the key things that people care about, right? so let me bring this back to Drupal. One of the key things that came up at the SAW workshop 
And a key thing for security is a software inventory, right? What software is running on this server? What version of the software? That matters because when there is an alert that there is a vulnerability with a piece of software, you want to know immediately which servers have to be upgraded. So one of the core controls that I mentioned in the 853s, and one of the core things that people care about when they do certification and accreditation is what is my software inventory? Okay, it, I ought to be able to click a button in Drupal and get a list of what's installed, at least at the Drupal level, if not the entire server, right? What version of each module am I running? What plugins do I have, et cetera, et cetera? So um, it's really clear that from this work, the workshop is really interesting if you read the report because it talks about all the problems and the challenges. But what's really clear is the primary concerns are, are we configuring systems correctly and how do we know that they're configured correctly? Because that's often the biggest vulnerability. Oh, I forgot to set that. I forgot to change that password, right? I've got the default configuration that has something hard coded. So what's the configuration and what is the stuff that's running so that I can respond? What's the inventory? Um, number eight, uh, GSA 18F. Uh, it's called, GSA has a new group called 18F. It's called 18F because at their corner at 18 and F Street is where they're located. <laughs> uh, there's been, GSA has tried to sell different technology services and does provide technology service to the federal government. GSA, as the rest of the federal government, um, while it's done much better with things about guidance on website and social media and things like that. It's really struggled with how do you do agile? How do you, how do you get agencies to work with agile? How do you get people to understand the virtualization and the DevOps and all of these faster ways of working that um, startups are doing? 18F is this focus point of energy of modernizing IT. Um, it's, it's a very exciting group. You can look up some of the things they're doing. So one of the things that they've got going on is a FISMA ready, they've, they've published guidance for a FISMA ready version of, a, of Ubuntu. And that's up on GitHub right now. And there's also a vision there of kind of, if we can get an ATO for Solar or Elasticsearch or Drupal, that that could be, it could actually be ATO'd and then that ATO could be shared. So you're using the version that GSA approved. So these are the, some of the visions and things that people are trying to do. So I think the GSA 18F is a force for good internal to government. And um, number nine, open source baselines. Um, you can, if you want to lock down Drupal or you want to lock down MySQL, you probably Google harden MySQL or you know, how do I secure something and you'll find guidance it's referred to as guidance. You'll find guidance often in people's blog posts or other things. Well, there are a variety of places like the uh, Center, Net, Center for Internet Security where you can get official guidance, but these tend to be PDF documents. That's useful, but it would be a lot more useful if it was machine readable. Uh, however, there is very little machine readable baseline guidance for open source software. However, we're starting to work to change that and there are forces that are starting to change it. So as I mentioned before, FISMA ready Ubuntu, we're actually working on making that machine ready, machine readable so that you can just lock it down with code instead of having to read the directions and apply all the steps. Um, we're also taking something called the SCAP security guide, uh, SCAP security guide, um, which is currently just built for Red Hat and we're working on porting it over to CentOS and to AWS, AWS Linux. So you could get an AWS Linux and lock it down to a particular baseline. And the final sign, um, GovReady Docs. Uh, the project that, uh, we're, that Civic Actions is doing while we're working on getting this particular system through FISMA IT compliance, we are also trying to do that in a, in a GitHub sorry, not GitHub, but in a Git-based code repository. 
The idea is to actually move the system security plan off of Microsoft Word and into Markdown and manage it along with the network topology diagram um, and all the other information, management, manage it in a GitHub, in a Git repository. And um, produce, and so one of the goals is to, pro is to produce a generic repository that would be available on GitHub that was specific to Drupal systems, right? Because most Drupal systems are going to be very similar, right? So that we would have, so if you were working on a Drupal system, you could go to this repo and basically get um, the template for the system security plan and a, and a bunch of other information and the things we've talking about so that we could produce the system security plan and the various um, CNA artifacts that we could produce them in code or from code, they could be compiled in the same way, in the same way that, we pr that we would produce the content management system. So I'm getting a good head nod from Bruce, so I know that that's, yeah, so, but basically we should stop managing, we should stop managing um, our certification and accreditation artifacts as Word documents, and we should start managing them as part of the code base itself. Where are you in this process? Uh, I would, so, so it's, it's uh, where are we? I'm hoping that within this quarter, of, in, the, in the first quarter of 2015, we would have a generic version of the repo publicly available. So we're actively, we're, where we are right now is we've, we've, um, we've used some tools to create a pipeline for taking existing Word documents um, and translating them to Markdown. Uh, breaking them up into pieces so that you're managing, you're managing the individual aspects um, in smaller bits like you would a block of code uh, and then be able to write some compiler to generate out documents uh, to actually be backward compatible with auditors that still want to see the documents. But I think, I think where we're at is we're looking for, and we are looking, I'm looking for collaborators we're looking for collaborators because I, because we uh, Civic Actions is very invested in Drupal, has done a variety of other things to work on quality assurance and automating quality assurance um, using BHAT and some other tools. So we're very interested in, we think that Drupal is a really great place to start. Uh, so I would say very eager for people that want to partner with this to help us figure out what this looks like and, and start to create a generic uh, repo. And then, and glue it glue it to Drupal, right? Create some connectors so that you can control, so if you change some, if you choose a different module or you, or you alter a control uh, in Drupal, that that automatically reports out to uh, a single source of truth for a compliance <laughs> repository, right? Because I, you know, what, what are the passwords and controls inside of Drupal? How do we report that back out? That's pretty much it. Oh, great, good, thanks. Yeah, so I, I guess, I, I mean, how, how I, taking the next step from just what we're doing to working with the community and saying, well, where, where could Drupal, where we could, could we get a foothold and, and begin to connect these things up? What sort of stumbling blocks or hurdles are you guys facing right now in the development of this? That's a really good question. Um, I, I think that the, so I think the biggest stumbling block would have to be what should be the overall organization of the repository, right? We're used to getting these big Word documents. Um, what's the right way to conceptually organize the repository? So I think that that's, I think that that's a really, I think that that's a very big uh, hurdle right now. What's gonna make sense to a whole community of people as opposed to just, you know, my eyes? Um, I the think agencies have ideas on how they want that to happen. Or how no, I think that this is really you know I I, I think that there's what, what I was trying to get across in this presentation is that there's a lot of there's a lot of forces that are saying we've got to automate this stuff. We can't we can't keep going with having agile and having drush and ha and then run into this six month <laughs> manual <laughs> compliance process. We've got to, we've got to and, and, from a good, and from a security point of view, we want security baked in from the very beginning. That's what security people say, but the security people don't want to review an in-progress system. They want to review something that's ready to go to production. So, so um, 
I think, and I think the, the other, I'll tell you the other biggest hurdle. I think the other biggest hurdle is the education gap. People don't feel it's their job, right? Developers don't feel it's their job to do security. Um, and, no, and it's nobody's job to do compliance, yeah. right? It's, it's like, I can tell you, the security people don't want to do it, right? Because they are, they are really busy trying to protect, protect stuff, and they're busy trying to maintain their expertise in the face of emerging threats. Um, and they practice paranoia. The developers want to work on features, and so they're like, I, I, I don't want to deal with it. And they look at, and they, you know, you look at the 853 and you go, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to read this document. You know, and that's just one of 30 NIST special publications that you're supposed to. So, so, I think, so I think the education gap is really big. How do, I, how do I get people to say, yeah, we can begin to do this and make it, and make it feel like approachable? And then I think also just kind of generally structuring it. That's a great. That's a great question. So, um, I mean, I have a space right. That's a. That's a. Right. That's a. Right. Surely that's not. No. That's a. That's a great. It's a great question. I would. If you think about it from a data, this all began. This all began in the '70s when information started to get computerized, and suddenly I had. Uh, I had a database with people's social security numbers, right? So PII. I've got someone's social security number or I've got their address and all this other information. So whenever people talk about data spills, they're talking, so the first data sets that this stuff applies to is stuff that has social security numbers, PII in it, right? And now if you apply it to the data base, the system of records, well then you've also got to apply it to the system that is managing that data set, right? Um, I think what's happening now is People are starting to worry about critical infrastructure. They're going from, um, okay, government protecting particular databases to how do I ensure that a terrorist can't take down or a common hacker can't take down the network that runs the clean water supply for my city? Critical infrastructure, right? Um, the earth science community collecting data about natural forces, a natural phenomenon, enjoys a privileged situation when it comes to open data vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the government, right? You don't have to do a paperwork reduction act to put out a bunch of sensors because the data collection would be burdensome on mother nature, right? So you guys get to just deploy your sensors and get big data. Whereas if you are working at a different agency, you've got to go through the Paperwork Reduction Act before you can even collect data. And since you enjoy that phenomenon, I think that you're right. You also enjoy, well, look, it, I'm just collecting temperatures. At some point, I think what's going to happen, I'm guessing it's already starting to happen, but what's going to happen is that weather data is combined with demographic or other information that begins to be a little bit more sensitive and proprietary. So as soon as I combine that weather data with changes that I've been doing to my water supply system, right, now I've got some much more sensitive data, potentially. I could say even like maybe your data, your data center is secure in the sense that, um, not, not secure, it doesn't have that demographic component in it, but your users might be depending on your data in, in a real-time stream. Da downstream data um, producers uh, who are combining data with demographic, and then if there's a security threat to, um, upstream and someone hacks your system and puts in erroneous data, it could have implications that you don't anticipate. I, that's, that's, it's a, that's a fabulous point. You've, you've described the supply chain. Um, and the, one of the things that tends to happen is this particular data set is, a low, is, is not a high risk data set. It doesn't have confidential information, but it's co-located on a server that has something that's high risk, or the user of that information actually deals with these two systems. 
And so the low, qual the, the low risk system becomes an attack vector for phishing attacks or for other things on the individual or on the individual system who also has access to another system. Well, in a different aspect of that, I mentioned we have a NASA data center, so we're on a massive network. So even though we're only working with Earth Science Data, which is freely available, you still have to go through all these. Exactly, because you're on the same because you're on the same network, okay. and and I think if you know the power of reusability with Drupal also means that. Um, you don't want to not care about security because this Drupal system is dealing with this low risk data set because then the module, and then someone takes that module and they move it into, and they try to apply it to a different Drupal system which has a high value data set on it. And I, and I think, you know, and the open source community in general has kind of been like, eh, not my job. I don't have to care about it, but then when you know when you're suddenly your chief data officer at the FCC and you're like, shoot, we could use Drupal, we could use WordPress, we could use this great tool, and I don't have to spend as much money and I get all these things, and then security people say, no thanks, I'm not going to do it, I don't trust it, how are you scanning it, how are you managing configuration, where do I go to get the vulnerability list, and so they put the kibosh on using the tool. Or they say, hey, you can only use the tool in this particular, in this particular environment. And then, it's, say, and then they say, well, go, go, use, go use Microsoft because SharePoint is secure, right? And then, and then the CIO says, well, I'm not going to do Drupal and SharePoint. SharePoint's secure. Screw Drupal. We're going with SharePoint. And I'm like, no, you know? I, so so it's, 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 that's, where, that's where this stuff is, becomes an institutional battle. You know, I, I know, like you say, there's, there's the software that's been secured for government use, right? And, and Drupal is, is nowhere organized enough, Drupal.org and that, is, is nowhere organized enough to make that happen. And you, yes, I think that you're right. Drupal is not organized, in, but at the same time, Drupal does have a big beachhead. Yeah. Right, Drupal has a big beachhead because people have been saying, hey, well, I'm going to apply it to this data that isn't PII. I can use it over here for the search science data. I can use it for this other stuff. So it's got this. So it's got a beachhead, and you've got Acquia, and you've got some other people that have done the work, that have done the heavy lift on their part of that world um, to go through it. And now the question is, if we really want to expand the use, we have to exp we have to get organized yeah. and do that. Yeah. So in, in civic actions, are are you creating distribution that are I've gone through the process that are. I think that that would be part of the. I, I think the. I think that, uh, yes, I think that Civic Actions has bought into the vision that we can create a distribution of Drupal that is accreditation ready, and and Civic Actions has said, hey, we're down with supporting the development of that, um, and we're working and we're and we're working on it, and I think that that's. But you know, that's just one. That's one group that's getting started, and the question now is to build is is to try to build that community, um, and it ranges from so there's the hardcore work of organizing the supply chain, you know the Drupal.org, so organizing that supply chain, and then I think the other piece is once you organize the supply chain, make it automated to produce the assets, the artifacts. Dave, you had a yeah. There's um Did you put that in the notes? Which aims to, um, not yet, but which aims to address these kind of things. Oh, great. The issues. So I don't know if you were No, I'm not. I, I wasn't aware of that. So that that's something. Yeah, will you, add it to the, will you add it to the notes section? Yeah, I will, yeah. And, help, and, and that would be great. So yeah, that might be a good starting point. For this. What, what time is the hacking this afternoon? 1.30. All right, I, I'm not 100% sure of my schedule. I have to go take care of a, of a dog. but. Uh, and I don't know if you, I'm really, I really appreciate the engagement because I know that this stuff is really wonky and technical, and, but it's a fly in the ointment that is killing us. Um, so I got to check my emails or other stuff, but I don't know if this might be a topic for the hackathon. Um, I don't think we necessarily need to hack anything, but I think maybe figuring out some of the organization or next steps would be really right. cool. Right. So, and even if it's not this hackathon, maybe 
we yeah. continue the conversation for another one. Right. Yeah. And we're, we're back here next January, too. Right. Okay, great. Well, thank you very I don't know what our time is. Are we? <clears throat> yeah, I think it's right. just about lunchtime. Yeah. Okay. So it's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Really thank you, guys. It. Yeah. Thank great. you. Guys.